All right, thank you. Actually, how is it uh, pronounced, if not Gromenauer? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Um, indeed, I'm Zoltan Lehowski, and with my colleague Benedek Farkashil here, if you would like to show you how you how to turn your software into computer chips, a piece of hardware, pieces of hardware. Uh, the first part of the talk will be me um, showing you what is Hasslier, how it works, how you can work with Hasslier, and why should you care. And the second part will be Benedek telling you about a new number format. How, it's, um, how you can use it, why is it good, how it works together with Hasslier, and why you should care. So I hope you will care all along. So let's see. Um, just a bit of interaction before anything else. We are from a company called Lombic Technologies. We are based in Budapest, Hungary. And, but actually all of our clients are friends. And our customers also include companies like Microsoft itself, or the Smithsonian Institution, or even Fortune. 500 companies. Day-to-day -day we are uh, doing web development with uh, Microsoft uh, um, .NET stack-based Orchard CMS. Um, are .NET developers here? Uh, quite a few, that, that's great. Uh, for all the others I will show a bit of C-sharp, but don't be afraid, you will surely understand it. But when we are not doing web development with Orchard, then we are doing some research and development, uh, including our project called Hasslier. Now, uh, actually, the inspiration of Hasslier comes from my university time, because uh, back, back in the day when I was uh, learning to become a software engineering and computer science major, we also had some um, logic hardware design classes. And during those labs, uh, we basically had to design little CPUs. And at the time, that was really cumbersome. So if you had done any hardware design, you understand it. If you have uh, just been doing software development, be thankful because it's much more convenient than hardware design. And at the time I had the idea that there should be a way to do this in C-sharp. Well, there was no way to do that in C-sharp, but there is now. Uh, just a word of warning, uh, Hasslier, what I will be uh, showing here today, uh, works. It works fairly well. It has some nice results. Um, it's already usable, but it's kind of in an alpha stage. It's not ready for production level workloads yet. But this is the case we'll see later. So, what is Hasslier? Uh, what the hell are we talking about? Hasslier is basically a tool that takes a computer program and creates an equivalent computer chip, the piece of hardware out of it. We could also say that um, Hasslier is a tool that takes, a, takes some logic which is expressed as software form and creates some equivalent logic which is expressed as hardware form. So before you had a piece of software, now you have a piece of hardware. The logic stays the same, the algorithm stays the same, what it computes stays the same, but the, the, the form of it uh, is transformed into a hardware. And all of this happens with some magical devices called FPGAs. Uh, have any of you at least heard of FPGAs before? Please raise your hands. Okay, almost anybody. For those few of you who haven't, um, FPGAs uh, or field programmable gate arrays are basically computer chips that can behave like any other computer chip, um, within limitations of course. So basically they can be dynamically reconfigured, rewired on the fly. And this is what we utilize with Hasslier. So we could also say that um, Hasslier is using something that, uh, that Pink or even Azure is already utilizing. Because uh, if you are not aware, uh, Bing, the search engine where you Google something on Bing, is um, accelerated by FPGAs as of maybe four years ago. Similarly, Azure already has FPGAs. Uh, but sometimes FPGAs are also found in household appliances like routers. Or if you went to a doctor and got an X-ray or a PET or an MRI scan, those machines commonly also have FPGAs inside them. And um, the pretty fashionable topic of uh, self-driving vehicles is not without FPGAs either. Uh, self-driving cars sometimes use FPGAs for computing tasks. But uh, to utilize an FPGA, you have to be a hardware engineer or possess hardware engineering skills. And that's kind of a downside. To alleviate some confusion, although FPGAs have visible circuit boards, uh, as I have shown, they have nothing to do with Raspberry Pis. Uh, raspberries are just small computers, although uh, there are raspberries bundled together with FPGAs. And similarly, microcontrollers have 
pretty much nothing to do with FPGAs either. So, uh, to get back to our train of thoughts, uh, what Hessler does is that it takes your computer program and creates some equivalent FPGA logic of it. And not just any computer program. So, as mentioned, we are pretty much a .NET shop. So, uh, we are talking about .NET programs. But the, new, uh, but the good thing is that we are processing, Hessler is processing .NET assemblies. So, not the actual C sharp code, but uh, the kind of the .NET byte code that every .NET language is compiled into. And that means that you can use not just C sharp or Visual Basic, but even uh, CLI, C++, or functional languages like F sharp, or even scripting languages like Python, PHP, or JavaScript. All right, um, that's kind of cool, I would guess, but why on earth are we doing this? Well, uh, the reason is that FPGAs have some very unique computing benefits. So let's talk about these uh, for a minute. And let's try to compare, uh, well, CPUs that we all use every day and GPUs that we also use every day and FPGAs that we probably haven't used yet. And let's talk about uh, the parallelization, the, the amount of uh, parallel things you can compute on these devices first. Well, uh, CPUs are, are roughly on the, on the lower end here, because in a CPU you have uh, maybe four, maybe eight, maybe, maybe 64 cores, uh, but that's about the top of it. In a GPU, in, in orange, um, GPUs are much more parallelized devices. You ha have thousands of little processing cores all working in parallel. Now, FPGAs in gray are kind of a middle ground because an FPGA doesn't really have cores, although that's not entirely true. Um, the amount of parallelism you can get with an FPGA is in the order of magnitude of hundreds, sometimes thousands, depending on the specific use case. Next, let's talk about the complexity of programs you can run on these devices. Well, uh, CPU's been here, because if it's a software, if it's a piece of software, you can run it on a CPU. Uh, sometimes uh, you have to use emulation or jumping through hoops, but in the end you can run it. Uh, with GPUs, the programming model is much more limited. Uh, so I would say that's, again, the other extreme, but on the lower end here. And FPGAs, although you can't really program an FPGA, but with high-level tools like Hessler, if you, uh, if you create a hardware implementation out of your program, what you can use in your programs is roughly in between. You can't do anything uh, just like on a CPU, but a bit more, it's a bit more flexible uh, than on a GPU in certain aspects. And lastly, let's talk about power efficiency. Uh, so how many things you can compute with one watt of power. Now, CPUs and GPUs are roughly on the same level here. Uh, FPGAs, on the other hand, are highly power efficient devices. This is where FPGAs really shine. And the reason is that with an FPGA, you basically get an application specific coprocessor. So you get a, a processor that just computes what your application needs to be computed. And because of that, it can be very efficient, uh, also compute wise and also power wise. But there is a huge downside, and as mentioned before, you have to learn hardware engineering. Because programming CPUs or GPUs is fairly easy, but utilizing an FPGA is something completely different. You have to uh, think in terms of clock cycles and logic gates and wires. It's nothing like programming. You still write code, some kind of code, uh, in certain aspects, but it's very different. And I would say quite cumbersome. So, uh, all in all, what we are shooting for with Hessler is to get the computing benefits of FPGAs for all of us software developers. So, uh, with FPGAs, you can get a performance increase uh, in certain cases for certain algorithms together with a power consumption decrease. And if you are thinking of uh, applications run that run on tens of thousands of computers in a, in a data center, uh, power efficiency matters a lot as well, of course. And all of this is still software development as usual. Now, just to give you an idea of which applications can benefit from FPGAs, here are a few examples. Uh, not all of these have to do anything with Hessler, but FPGAs. And for example, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, both in train on the training and the execution side, FPGAs are, are utilized already. Um, remember that FPGAs are 
quite highly parallelized uh, parallel devices, so uh, these applications touch on these uh, on that aspect as well. Image and video processing also because of parallelization um, is quite well suited for FPGAs too. Uh, algorithmic trading uh, on stock exchanges, high frequency trading, is where FPGAs are used because they can basically sit as a piece of hardware on the network and trade with most possibly other uh, pieces of software or other FPGAs. Uh, data compression, although it's a bit more I.O. bound, it's still uh, quite uh, useful to be accelerated uh, with FPGAs. I'm mentioning cryptocurrencies and cryptography together because where FPGAs can help here are, uh, hash, are the hash functions, hashing. And, uh, but not Bitcoin mining anymore, that ship has sailed, uh, but at one point actually for Bitcoin mining, FPGAs were also used. And lastly, due to their low power nature, FPGAs can also be used in embedded systems like robots or IoT devices, and they are being used as well. So, a lot of talk until now. Uh, let's see a demonstration on how you would work with Hessier. And I actually have an FPGA prepared here, so this will be a live demo. Uh, this is a relatively cheap um, and small and slow FPGA development board um, of type Nexus 4 DDR. Uh, but still, it will show some nice things. So, let's see. I will now switch over to Visual Studio, um, which is of course the .NET developer's um, ID of choice for most .NET developers. And what we see here is a sample called Parallel Algorithm. Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, why can't we see it on uh, screen? Mm. Is there uh, somebody who, who is uh, knowledgeable with computers? Uh, I just switched over to you from here to team. Yeah, okay. We will, we will do the old way of solving problems of turning off and on again. Okay, well, let's see. Okay, nice, good. It was some, uh, just some contact issues. Well, that's why we need wireless. Uh, then we can have interference as well. So, uh, again, what we see here is a sample called parallel algorithm, and as the name already suggests, it's a, well, a highly parallelized algorithm. It's nothing really useful, it's kind of an exaggerated example of the kind of algorithms that are especially suited to be accelerated by Hessler and by FPGAs. And what we have here is that this algorithm uh, takes a number as an input, uh, nothing really fancy until now, and then it starts some tasks. Now, on the, on the talk before, we have already seen uh, um, a little bit of tasks, but to reiterate, tasks in .NET are basically an abstraction over threads. So when we are starting a task, like here, then we are basically instructing the .NET task scheduler to eventually select a thread from the .NET thread pool and then execute what's inside the task. Uh, how many such tasks can uh, run in parallel it depends on the platform. So in this particular laptop here, I have four logical cores um, in an i5 uh, CPU. So the hardware level parallelism we'll get is, well, around five. But we are starting actually 280 tasks. Uh, 280 tasks because that's the amount that will fit on the FPG. Because we, what will happen is that when we process this uh, this application with Hessler, this whole thing will be turned into the FPGA implementation. And on the FPGA, on the hardware, we won't have 280 tasks, but we'll have 280 little processing cores. So on the hardware, we will get a hardware level parallelism of 280, like having a CPU that just does what your application needs with 280 cores. And remember, this is a small development board. So there are uh, FPGAs 50 times bigger than this. Um, so obviously, um, you can't just fit 280 pieces of this application uh, 10. Now, what happens in these tasks is 280 tasks is something fairly simple. Um, uh, here, the input is runs through a multiplication, whatever. Uh, but the main thing is happening here. Again, this is just a synthetic example to give you an idea. Uh, here is 
uh, some conditional logic which is executed 10 million times. And then the result is returned back from the task. So this here is standard C sharp. Uh, there are limitations in what you can do in heavier compatible code, but um, we, uh, we support a lot of constructs. Um, so it's pretty convenient, I think. Now, uh, next we wait for all of these tasks to finish. And once that happens, we sum together their results. And that sum, uh, that accumulated sum, will be the output of the whole algorithm. So again, uh, pretty simple, but let's see how it works. Because now I'm starting the application. This is part of a, a small console application that hosts um, everything that's needed to, e to uh, orchestrate Hasslier. And first, it will generate the hardware implementation. And this happens on this machine. So it will basically generate the hardware code that is then configured uh, on the FPGA. And once that happens, it starts to execute uh, this logic on the, on the FPGA that I have here three times. And finally, it executes it once on the CPU as well. So let's see the results. Uh, it took, uh, here we have um, the execution time. And as you can see, all three times, it took around 300 milliseconds. Well, actually, if you take a closer look, it took exactly the same amount of time, down to the 10,000th millisecond. Uh, and the reason is that um, since an FPGA is basically an application-specific coprocessor, it's also uh, deterministic in the execution time because there is no operating system to run. Uh, there are no noisy neighbors. There is nothing, just your code. Uh, well, it took around 300 milliseconds on the FPGA. If we also take into account uh, the communication round trip uh, with the board, so the amount of time this, um, the data uh, took to go back and forth uh, via this USB cable, it was just below 400 milliseconds. Um, now let's see how long it takes on the CPU. And on the CPU, it takes around five, uh, five and a half seconds. So uh, the CPU is about 10 times slower than the FPGA. The FPGA, although being a low-end device, is 10 times faster. Now, of course, this wasn't a very scientific measurement, and my, my machine is probably doing a lot of other stuff. But even, uh, even without that, it would be an order of magnitude faster. So this should give you a bit of an idea of what's possible with FPGAs and with Hasslier. Uh, now, this also shows you that um, that this whole thing is uh, is best utilized if your uh, if your logic is highly parallelized and um, and compute bound, the CPU bound. By the way, uh, what else we have in this uh, in this piece of logic is uh, still uh, standard C sharp. Just one uh, piece of API uh, that you have to use is this simple memory object here. Uh, we need a simple memory object to communicate with the FPGA, uh, to, to push data there and receive data back. Uh, this is what you have seen on this line, where we read uh, an integer out of that, and on the last line, where we write the integer output back. So there are a few uh, pieces of plumping like that that you have to use, uh, but not much. And we'll get eventually get rid of that. And now I will hand over to Benedek, who will, who will talk about something related, but something completely different. OK, can you hear me all right? I guess so, because I hear my voice. So uh, in the second part of this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about next generation arithmetics. So the first question is, what, what is it and why should you care? Uh, what's wrong with the current generation if there's a next one? So uh, the thing is that uh, IEEE floats were designed decades ago, and the hardware that we are actually uh, in possession uh, is, is completely different from decades ago. There's a, there's a huge uh, improvement in terms of what hardware we're using, and, and actually the problems that we are solving uh, using this hardware, uh, these are completely different. And uh, the IEEE floats are actually a bit of faithful. For example, uh, we base a lot of uh, beat patterns on NATA numbers, which aren't very really useful. Um, at the beginning, they were designed in a way that we could actually have uh, we could actually assign different meanings to them, which would help the developers uh, uh, identifying problems. But in the end, they weren't really utilized, so we're just wasting them. 
Um, another problem with those is that um, there are some special edge cases. Um, well, not, not exactly edge cases, but there's a lot of bit patterns that has, has to be handled differently from, from regular number uh, bit, uh, bit strings. Uh, so they require an, a different uh, kind of logic, which of course takes up more space. It makes the whole, uh, the, the whole chip uh, basically uh, more complex. Um, the value distribution uh, is not really user-friendly in a way that um, real-world calculations actually uh, tend to prefer numbers around one, uh, and floating-point numbers do not really accommodate this kind of requirement. So uh, we actually usually scale our, our computations to one because those are easier to comprehend. And uh, the dynamic range, range and precision is locked. So you have a certain number of bits, and uh, uh, the actual uh, range and the precision that they can represent is, is in the standard, you can't change it at all. So the solution is to use an alternative number format. Uh, in this uh, presentation I'm going to show you uh, one, the, one that is called POSIT. Uh, POSIT is the third generation of a number format called the universal number, uh, which is developed by a mathematician called Dr. John Gustafsson. So a POSIT is um, uh, kind of similar in some ways uh, to, a, to a standard floating point number. So we have a sine bit, for example, which is uh, quite obvious. Um, we have an exponent. Uh, this is the only fixed size, uh, or not exactly fixed size, but this is the only part of the posit that you need to predefine. And actually, if you say that I need uh, three as an exponent size, it can actually be uh, uh, somewhere between zero and three, depending on the on the number. Uh, you of course have a fraction, but you don't actually uh, need to uh, have any any of these uh, in some cases. Uh, and another and, and the extra part here is the regime bit. Basically, the regime and the exponent uh, define. Uh, how the number scales in terms of in terms of dynamic range, so uh, you can configure this to your liking to your specific application. Uh, I I won't really go into too much detail. Uh, I can talk to you uh, uh, about this after the presentation. But this topic in itself deserves its own its own conference, not even its own presentation, but its own conference, which actually happened not long ago in in Singapore at a conference called uh, Conference for Next Generation Arithmetics. Not a surprising name. Um, so let's look at uh, a, a how a posit looks like. Uh, this is actually the type 2 universal number. As I mentioned, the posit is the third generation, but in this respect they behave, behave in the same way. As you can see, uh, we have uh, negative numbers on the left side and, and the positive numbers on the right side, and, and it kind of wraps around towards positive and negative infinity. There are some special um, properties to this, to this number format. Uh, a positive thing about it, pun intended, is that uh, we don't have a separate negative zero, which is also kind of a shortcoming of, of, uh, of IEEE standards. Uh, and there's a bunch of more uh, interesting details, uh, but for the lack of time, uh, let's just skip them. Uh, but let's talk about how, uh, how you can, uh, why, why, you should, why should you use it. So the posit is, is interesting for a lot of things. For example, they, store, they can store the same information with less bits. So this is really important because, like I mentioned, the hardware that we are using and the, and the problems we are solving are quite different from, from a couple of decades ago. And now, actually, the, uh, the bottleneck is, is energy efficiency. So if you, can, you, if you can store the same information with less bits, then you have to move uh, less bits or bytes uh, between, between, for example, memory and CPU cache, which means that you are actually uh, using up uh, less energy. Uh, a very important properties of, of these number formats is that each, um, each bit string uh, requires the same circuitry. So there are no edge cases, there are no special cases. The, the same, actually smaller piece of hardware can accommodate all the posit values. Uh, you don't need to care about CPU flags, so IEEE floats uh, in general actually sort of require you to, to know about CPU flex, but nobody cares about those because developers are lazy. Uh, so in some cases, you'll just end up losing some kind of information and run, running into some kind of problem. Uh, it's also a problem of you know, different architectures and things like that. None of that is, is uh, existing with posits. And um, like I mentioned, a posit is, is basically a configurable number format, which means that uh, you can configure it specifically to your, to your problem. So if you know that uh, you need high dynamic range, you can configure it in a way 
uh, that you can use uh, huge numbers and uh, you will still have some some precision of course if you if you have a fixed number of bits you obviously need to have some trade off uh, but still you have a choice which is very important and of course since uh, actually the uh, the circuitry like i mentioned is is much simpler and it's kind of a, a unified uh, unified one, it, it always gives a uh, consistent result uh, across platforms. There are also like a ton more details to this, uh, and I'm happy to, to talk about it uh, after the presentation if you're interested. Uh, so let's talk about something that is, is really a, a kind of a selling point for these number formats, which is the value distribution, as I mentioned. So <coughs> on, the, on, the, uh, on this upper chart here, we are comparing 8-bit uh, RGPL floats with 8-bit posits, uh, and we have 1-bit for the exponent uh, for the posit and the fork 3 configuration for the uh, for the ITP float, the, the eighth bit is, is of course at the beginning is the sign bit. So as you can see, uh, we, we see that um, the values gravitate more towards one, uh, which is really a real life example, a real life uh, uh, problem of uh, with, with actually crunching numbers. We need uh, more numbers around one, we need precision there. Um, but of course, if, if you want to go higher and higher on actually to very, very low numbers, you also have a choice to configure it in a way that you can use huge numbers uh, on both ends of the scale. And we can see kind of a similar example where you don't have, uh, you don't have exponent bits for the posit, so it, it kind of gets uh, crammed into a smaller space, uh, so to say, around one, so you get higher precision. So the question is, um, uh, this is really nice, so I want to start using it because probably all of you are you know, searching around and no, none of you because you are listening, which is very nice. So, but uh, posits are actually, uh, posits actually have a couple of different implementations in a couple of different languages. Many of these are, almost all of these are free and open source. Um, we of course, as Alta mentioned, we are a .NET, uh, we are a company that uses .NET technologies and we are actually C-sharp developers uh, for quite a long time, so we, we started with the C-sharp implementation and we also transformed it into, into FPGA using Hestlayer. So in this uh, video, I'm going to show you a demonstration of how they work. This, this will be somewhat similar to what uh, Zoltan showed you earlier. So as you can see, we have this simple memory object here, which is used to receive an input value, uh, which we are going to use as the basis of our calculation. And then we have, uh, we, so we read out this number, then we initialize uh, a 32-bit posit, uh, standard C-sharp programming, so no you know, kind of hardware magic there. You can use it like any other uh, number format. And then what we're going to do is just to calculate uh, the sum of all the numbers up, up into the parameter that we are receiving from simple memory. In this case, it will be 100,000. So this is a really simple example. And uh, you, can, you may notice that we are actually working with, uh, with integers here, but these are all working with floating point numbers as well, because that's the whole point actually, uh, substituting floating point numbers. Um, so what we're going to do is start a, a, similar, uh, a similar application uh, that we have seen before and, and see how the results go. And then when we are finished uh, with the calculation, we're going to put this value back into the simple memory. So basically this is how the FPGA will actually send back this information. Uh, to the host CPU. And as you can see, uh, at the second row, this calculation took 122 uh, milliseconds on the CPU, and as, uh, as Zoltan explained, now the hardware generation starts and the host CPU is going to start to communicate with the FPGA, and then the FPGA is going to execute uh, this algorithm, and uh, we will see uh, how the results go. And it will be uh, somewhat interesting, uh, but uh, we will see in a moment. And uh, yeah, there's some, other, uh, there's some other information there about what's happening. So we are actually counting up until, uh, until 100,000. So when the FPGA starts to execute this algorithm, you will see that the calculation took uh, 211 uh, milliseconds, and, it actually, uh, uh, and it's actually 288 milliseconds, including communication round trip. So what we are seeing is that it's slower. Yeah, because it's, it's because it's not really a fair uh, comparison because uh, in this case we are talking about a, a CPU that has eight uh, logical threads at uh, 3.2 gigahertz 
and uh, we are comparing an FPGA with 100 megahertz, and it's actually using uh, five as the level of uh, parallelism, uh, just because uh, that's, that's how many uh, posit cores we can fit on this small FPGA. So the takeaway here is that posits are actually uh, more energy efficient, uh, in, in this case, um, not just because of the FPGA, but because how it's working. But of course, uh, if, we, if we actually uh, translate this performance back into uh, clock cycles, uh, the posits are usually three times as, as efficient. So the next steps would be to, to implement a bunch more uh, operations for posits. Um, there's a, there's a couple of uh, easy ones that we have already done. We will, of course, add further ones like division, uh, exponents, trigonometric functions, and fused operations. So those are, those are um, uh, coming up. And what's really interesting is that I mentioned that um, these number formats are kind of flexible and variable. Um, and you may, you may have noticed, obviously, that, that we are talking about a 32-bit posit here, and then I'm mentioning 8, 16, and 64-bit uh, uh, variants here. So why is that? Uh, the idea here is that you can use, I don't know, 183-bit posits, if that's what you like, uh, but there's a lot of uh, real-world application where the, actual, where the hardware gives you some limitations. Uh, and in some cases, you really just don't need more bits. Uh, and so um, what, what we are doing with these is that the 8, 32, 8, 16, 32, and 64-bit versions are just easier to manage, and we will generate these uh, with cogeneration. And an interesting use case is that um, it's been tested that 8-bit uh, posits are very, very efficient and actually quite effective at uh, deep, deep neural networks. And another kind of extension of the, of the posit is to use uh, interval arithmetics, which you can also do with floating point numbers. But in, in many cases, if you do interval arithmetics with floating point numbers, is that you will do some number crunching over time, and the result you will see is that the, the result is somewhere between negative infinity and positive infinity. So thank you, Captain Obvious. So uh, posits are actually much more friendlier and give you uh, much better results uh, due, due to their nature. Uh, so to wrap up, um, Hasslayer needs more use cases, and posits are interesting for us because they actually open up the possibilities for, for a lot more use cases. Um, and we actually need floating point calculations on, on, the, on FPGA with Hasslayer, so posits are a really great uh, a solution to that because uh, general floating point numbers are actually um, much more complex, and so they give us trouble. Posits are, are much friendlier and, of course, more energy efficient and, of course, more precise. Um, and we want to make uh, Hasslayer HPC ready, which means that we will support bigger FPGAs because, as Altan mentioned, we have a small development board here, and, uh, and with bigger FPGAs, we can, of course, that using bigger FPGAs and supporting bigger ones also open up a lot of uh, possibilities. And, um, and what the future holds is that FPGAs uh, are or are and will be in every data center. Uh, Amazon Web Services already have FPGAs that you can that you can use uh, as a developer. Microsoft Azure already uses FPGAs internally. So, for example, they are using it for for uh, for routing. Uh, but Project Catapult is is something that will open up uh, further possibilities for for developers. And what's also interesting is that Intel. Uh, not so long ago uh, acquired the second biggest FPGA manufacturer, Altera. So Intel is now an FPGA manufacturer, because it, that, and that's a pretty, pretty big deal. So if you'd like to uh, try all of these, uh, not, just, not just Posit, but everything related to Hasslayer, you should check out the SDK. It's, it's open source on GitHub. And uh, yeah, and go full YOLO on FPGAs, because the future uh, we'll, we'll actually bring FPGAs uh, closer to us, and we hope to help you uh, achieve uh, your goals or uh, better results uh, with Hasslayer uh, by helping you to use uh, FPGAs in, uh, in a regular manner, just like you use FP, uh, CPUs and maybe GPUs as well. So um, if you liked all of these, uh, these are all the links and, and contacts that you, that you need to know. And with this, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah.